Why do so many people love the original Iron Man, the one all the way back from 2008? What did the writers and storytellers do in that movie that made it resonate with so many people? On today's show, I'm breaking down the original Iron Man to see what story structure the writers and storytellers used to make Iron Man come to life. In order to do that well, we'll be using Sid Field's thoughts on the paradigm. Sid Field's paradigm, a storytelling structure specifically created for film. And we'll be applying Sid Field's thoughts on structure to both the finished film and the script. I'm Jay Shear, this is How Stories Work, and let's figure out why the MCU resonates with so many people. Today's question, how does the story structure of Iron Man work? If you love Iron Man or storytelling or both, please click that like button for me. Let's dig deeper into the narrative structure of Iron Man. Let's start by taking a look at classic traditional storytelling structure. Generally speaking, this arc is what most classical storytellers would have used if we go back even thousands of years, really. Everything is normal is where we begin. That's where the setup starts. Then we have rising action where there's lots of conflict. We reach the pinnacle of that action and the conflict, which is the climax. And then we have falling action, which is the closing of the story. And then the new normal, which is our resolution. This has been used for like millennia <laughs> from a storytelling structure perspective. But as storytelling has changed, we have TV shows, serial stories, episodic storytelling. This does alter slightly. And in terms of movies, it alters a little bit more. So let's take a look at the three-act structure, which came out of this original thinking. The traditional three-act structure basically applies three acts to the storytelling arc or the narrative arc. In this case, act one, part one of act two, and part two of act two, and then act three. But act two is long. And this is what we refer to as traditional three-act structure. The keys here from a storytelling standpoint are that everything is as it should be, then conflict arises wherein the characters are thrown for a loop and they have to develop all the way to the climax where they're making some critical decision or taking some critical action to move themselves into the new normal. And then the new normal is either going to be good or bad, depending on whether they succeed or fail. So this is a pretty, you know, typical storytelling arc that has been used for, like I said, millennia. Let's take a look at Sid Field's paradigm and see what he's suggesting we change to storytelling structure. And just to give a little bit of background, you can read this in the screenwriter's workbook. He has another book called Screenplay, which you can also read. One of the things that Sid Field did was he started assessing all the movies that were out there, all, especially the bigger blockbusters. And he looked for commonalities in terms of what was going on in those movies and what made those movies more or less successful and what made them more or less engaging. And he came up with what we're going to look at now, which is the paradigm. Then we're going to take the story structure of Iron Man and apply that directly to Sid Field's paradigm to see if the writers are using some of the elements from Sid Field's thinking in the structure of Iron Man in both the script and in the film. So let's just break this down really quick. Up at the top of the screen here, you've got act one, act two, and act three. You'll notice that act two is very long. There's a first and a second half to act two. I kind of mentioned that before in the narrative arc. You also know that there is plot point one and plot point two and the midpoint, okay? So basically what this is saying is, is that at the end of act one, there's a giant plot point that changes things. It takes the story in a new direction. There's a midpoint, which means that in the middle of the story, something will be revealed that pushes the story forward. It makes the story more exciting. Some bit of information, some action sequence, something changes. And then plot point two generally aligns with the climax of the story. This one moment where things have to be done a certain way in order for the people we want to win the day. Act one is referred to as setup. Act two is referred to as confrontation. And then act three is referred to as the resolution. Now, one of the things that Sid Field points out that is not reflected on this particular chart, but I'll show it to you as we go along, is that essentially modern day films need to have something that pushes the story forward, engages the audience in some form of tension or some form of excitement about every 15 minutes. Now, every page should be interesting of a script or every minute of a movie should be interesting. But particularly in order to keep people's attentions on films and keep them engaged, about every 15 minutes we need to see something that has a strong engagement point for people watching film. 
So let's jump into Iron Man and see what some of those moments are. Let's pretend the movie is two hours. That's pretty standard length for a movie. Some movies are only 90 minutes, but most movies are about two hours. In a two hour long movie, you can actually break that up into four parts and those four parts align with what's in the paradigm. The first half an hour is usually what's considered act one. The second half hour is the first half of act two. And then the third half hour is the second half of act two. And the last half hour, the fourth half hour is generally speaking act three. That's generally how these things tend to align. So the first thing we will expect to see in terms of the setup for Iron Man is that there will be some sort of inciting incident. And this is where the storytellers got pretty creative with the way that they introduced their inciting incident. Now, what is an inciting incident? An inciting incident is basically everything is normally as it would be, and then something happens, something is incited. This incident is incited, an inciting incident. And then it takes the, the whole story in a different direction. It's nothing's normal anymore. We got to figure out what's going on. Now, Iron Man has a pretty compelling way of doing that. You'll notice if you're reading the script or if you watch the film, the opening scene is the inciting incident. Now, I have two lines drawn on the screen here because we would expect to find the inciting incident at minute 15, somewhere around there. This is again, halfway through act one. So you kind of have this setup that happens where everything is normal. And then something happens in the middle of act one and we go, oh, whoa, not everything's normal anymore. Iron Man changes that dynamic a little bit because what Iron Man does is it puts the inciting incident in the opening scene. So this is where the Humvees are driving through the desert and Tony Stark is riding along with the military crew there. And Tony's fun V, which is what he calls it later, is attacked by the Ten Rings. And that is basically the inciting incident. What's interesting about Iron Man is that it goes from the inciting incident into a flashback to show us how we got to the inciting incident. So if you were to map this out from a chronological time perspective, the inciting incident would actually happen at about minute 17 or page 17. But they move that to the very opening scene to create more dramatic tension right off the bat. And then they move directly into a flashback scene to sort of show how we led up to the inciting incident. Pretty compelling way of changing that dynamic. And one of the biggest changes you'll see um, in the Sid Field normal paradigm compared to what the Iron Man storytellers and writers are actually accomplishing here. After we have the inciting incident, so we have inciting incident, flashback sequence, then when the inciting incident actually happened, again, it's about minute 17 or page 17 in the script, and then we see Tony as a prisoner with Jensen, and they're building the Mark I armor together. Plot point one, which is a big deal because it's going to take this script in another direction, is when Tony actually puts on the Mark I armor in order to escape. That happens at about minute 35 or so, about page 33 in the script. And that's when Tony's been in this cave the whole time, and now Tony needs to get out of the cave. And so when he puts on that armor, it is the impetus for us to get really excited about what comes next. It's pushing the for story forward in a new direction. Quickly following uh, plot point one comes Tony fighting off the Ten Rings. And in that process, Tony fights them all off and destroys a bunch of the Stark weapons. Now, Tony has figured out alongside this process of, you know, being captured um, and having to live in this cave with Jensen. By the way, it's, it's actually, uh, I didn't know this, but in the script, he's in there for a while. In the script, it reveals sort of like he's been out there for like three months, which you don't really get from the film because that's not in the film. I'll talk more about the differences between the film and the script in my next video, which you can check out on Patreon early, but it'll eventually be on my MCU playlist as well. So check that out if you want to kind of know some of the differences. But Tony fights off the Ten Rings and destroys all of the Stark weapons that the Ten Rings had. And that was very impactful for Tony because, of course, Tony's thinking, I don't want to be selling weapons to these guys. That's kind of like the first half of the first half of act two is <laughs> the beginning of act two is that is that moment there what you'll find is again m midway through the first half of act two about 15 more minutes it's really only about 12 minutes or so um, but it's around that 15 minute mark we see that tony announces the weapons division shutdown now that's going to propel the story even forward even more why because tony's creating tension he's creating conflict who's he creating conflict with obadiah or obi tony's business partner in stark industries that happens on about minute 
42 and about page 41 if you're trying to keep track of when that's actually happening. Following that, we actually get Tony building a new arc reactor, and he works on his Mark II suit. That actually is a pretty extended sequence, him both building the arc, the new arc reactor and the Mark II suit. There is really one minor difference in the script pertaining to the arc reactor itself that uh, you'll probably want to check out because it's just kind of funny to me. Um, but once Tony is done building the arc reactor and the Mark II suit, he does test the Mark II suit by taking it out for a test flight, essentially. That happens on page 56 or so, which is actually quite a bit different than the film, which happens at a minute 61. But that technically is the midpoint of this story. The Mark II being placed on Tony and him testing it out is the midpoint of the film. How do we know that? Well, because now the story moves quite a bit forward because Tony has a new piece of machinery that's far better than the Mark I that we saw him basically don earlier in the film. After the midpoint, Tony is attempting to change the course of Stark Industries and he's pushing harder and harder. While he's attending events, while he's out there doing things, he's actively fighting against the fact that um, they've been selling things to terrorist groups like the Ten Rings, and he's trying to get things moving towards more of an arc reactor type company that is building energy to power other things other than just weapons. And so to a certain extent here, Tony is, and I'll talk about this in the character arc video, there's a certain amount here where Tony is basically trying to move past the legacy that his father had. Not that his father's legacy was a problem, but that he needs to be his own person and move past what his father had done in the past after he starts to do these things like changing the course he goes to the gala there's some interesting but kind of strange if you know the rest of the mcu romantic scenes between him and pepper then we actually get uh the the middle point of this section of this third 30 minutes the mid 15 minute point here at minute 75 in the film and about page 79 in the script, Obadiah is revealed as the villain because he visits the Ten Rings and then he actually destroys all of the Ten Rings, at least the, the leadership of the Ten Rings. And then after that, what we get is Tony sees a news story where the remaining parts of the Ten Rings are actually out uh, terrorizing this small town. And Tony takes the Iron Man suit, the Mark II suit that he's just built, flies all the way out to Afghanistan in a sh really short period of time, and then fights all of these um, Ten Rings soldiers. And that's one of my favorite fight scenes in the MCU, by the way. I think it's really fun. The Iron Man suit looks amazing in those scenes. Even now, you know, how many, however many years has been later, it's, we're, I'm recording this video in 2022. This movie came out in 2008, and it's phenomenal. It looks great. That basically is leading up to the end of Act 2, and that's when we hit plot point Two. Now, what is plot point two? The audience knows that Obi has been revealed as the villain, but Pepper and, and Tony do not know that Obi is actually a villain. And this is when Pepper is downloading all the data because Tony is suspicious of what Obadiah is going to do. Pepper is downloading all the data and she discovers that Obadiah had hired the Ten Rings and paid them to kill Tony. And that's really plot point two, because now we are at the climax of the story. Now both sides know that there's no resolving this conflict or whatever resolution there's going to be is likely going to be pretty intense. So we've reached the climax of the story, which is plot point two, and that is Pepper discovering that Obadiah wants to kill Tony. Then we just move straight into a scene where Obi steals the arc reactor from Tony and has threatened Pepper and Tony already. So there's nothing left to do here besides for Tony in his Mark II suit to fight Obadiah. And that whole that thing plays itself out. Now, there is one other difference between the script and the movie that's really fascinating that we can talk about there as well. But that'll be my next video. So check that video out on my MCU playlist. So hopefully this gives you a pretty good idea of the structure of Iron Man. The only thing we have left to do, and I'll do this in another video, is take the... Tony's character arc and apply it to this structure to see how Tony changes as all the things around him change as the plot drives that change forward. But the big takeaways from applying Sid Field's paradigm to Iron Man are that it does 
follow the paradigm really, really closely. About every 15 minutes in this script and in this film, we do see incidents that drive the story forward, increase the tension, increase the conflict, and drive the story toward its inevitable conclusion. So why do people love this so much? Well, one of the reasons is it's structured really well. Now, can you have good structure apart from Sid Field's paradigm? Of course you can. There are other ways to structure stories that are also great, but we know this one works and it works for Iron Man. As you can see, Iron Man does follow Sid Field's paradigm very closely. And that's because it's a tried and tested solution to story structure, particularly for blockbuster films. Now, story structure is only one way that storytellers can make a story resonate with audiences. I'm also going to be doing some videos for Iron Man specifically related to the character arc in the film for Tony Stark and the premise, themes, and concepts and how all of those things resonate with audiences. Plus, does Iron Man have the best structure of all the MCU films or are there other films that actually have a more compelling structure? I'll be analyzing that in future videos as well. Check out my MCU playlist for all of that content as I develop it. And one more thing, what were the major differences between the script and the finished film? Check out my follow-up video, which is available to Patreon supporters right away, but will be available in my MCU playlist soon as well, to see what differences there are in the script and in the movie. There's one that relates directly to structure that's fascinating and was probably solved in the editing room. Thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next show.